Questions orales, Laurent Rapp. Oral questions, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président, après. Mr. Speaker, after the attacks by Hamas nearly two weeks ago, there are Canadians who are still in danger. 4,000 Canadians are looking for help from the federal government to get out of Israel. About 300 Canadians are trying to leave Gaza. And between 40,000 and 70,000 Canadians are in Lebanon. What is the government doing to protect Canadians that are in danger? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. President. Mr. Speaker, since this is the first time we are all in this house, since the horrible terrorist attacks by Hamas, allow me to say this. Canada is with the state of Israel and the Israeli people. Canada is at the side of Israel and the people of Israel and they can count on the continued support of Canada. We demand the immediate liberation of all hostages and unequivocally condemn the terrorist attacks done by Hamas. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Innocent lives, be they Palestinian or Israeli, Jewish, Muslim or Christian or otherwise, are all equally precious. Countless of those lives have been lost or put in danger as a direct result of the sadistic attacks of Hamas. And that was the purpose of those attacks, to exact as maximum damage on both Israelis and Palestinians and thwart any attempt for peace. We know that the regime in Iran was behind these attacks. And we know that the most powerful uh, uh, organizer of terrorism in the world is the IRGC, which operates legally in Canada today. Will the government accept the conservative, common sense bill to criminalize the IRGC in Canada? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is the first time we are all present in this House since these horrific terrorist attacks by Hamas on the State of Israel and the Israeli people. So I would like to begin by being very clear in English this time. Canada stands with the State of Israel and with the Israeli people. Israel can count on Canada's support. Canada condemns unequivocally Hamas's terrorist attacks, and we call for the immediate release of all hostages. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Last fall, the Finance Minister promised a balanced budget within six years. Last spring, she broke that promise and said that we'd have a balanced budget never. And last week, the Parliamentary Budget Officer revealed that her deficit is now 15 per cent bigger than she said it was only six months ago. Is the government, has the government lost total control of our debt? And how much is this inflationary spending going to add to the interest rates Canadians pay on their mega mortgages? Uh -huh. <laughs> the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government will be providing an update on our debt and deficit figures and on our revenues in the fall economic statement in due course. When it comes to Canada's fiscal position, let me also be very, very clear. Canadians should listen to the independent ratings agencies whose job it is to evaluate Canada's position and not the partisan talking Canada down attacks of the opposition. Canada's AAA rating has been reaffirmed by ratings agencies since the budget. We are strong fiscally. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Apparently, former Liberal Finance Minister John Manley is just a partisan using talking points <laughs> when he says that this government's inflationary deficits are like pressing the 
on the inflationary gas pedal and forcing the Bank of Canada to press on the brakes with higher interest rates. Canadian families have the highest debt load of any country in the G7, and those debts are colliding with the rates that this government is driving up. Will the finance minister cancel their inflationary deficits, balance the budget to bring down in interest rates and inflation, or will she admit that she's just not worth the cost? Yeah. Then I have Vice Premier Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me again bring some independent, non-partisan facts to this conversation. It is the job of the ratings agencies to determine the fiscal sustainability of every country's fiscal position. And ratings agencies have reaffirmed Canada's AAA rating. And you know why they did that, Mr. Speaker? Because we have the lowest deficit in the G7. And because, Mr. Speaker, we have the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. We believe in fiscal responsibility, Mr. Speaker, and the numbers show it. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Nonpartisan voice that I'm interested in is the shipyard worker in Vancouver who told me that his mortgage payment has now risen to $7,500 a month. $7,500 a month for a shipyard worker and a middle class family. That proves that this Prime Minister, after eight years, is not worth the cost of mortgage payments. According to John Manley, Liberal Finance Minister, their deficits are driving up interest rates on the back of mortgage holders. Will she reverse these deficits so that we can bring down inflation and interest rates before the shipyard worker and millions of Canadians lose their homes? Yeah. The Deputy Prime Minister. Speaker, talk is cheap. But actions speak louder than words. If these Conservatives actually believed in supporting Canadians during the housing crisis, they would be supporting Bill C-56. Right. This includes a critical measure lifting the GST on all new rental construction that will get more homes built faster. The Conservatives should actually act in the interests of Canadians and not continuing to parrot their talking points, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I also wish to congratulate you. The United States created a group of five powers, including Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, and France, to speak with a stronger voice in the face of the crisis that the entire world is facing, which is centered on Gaza. Canada, disappointingly, was not invited to participate in spite of the importance of the Jewish community here in Canada. Did the government ask to be part of this group? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Canada is an important member of NATO, the G7, and last week, I went to Morocco and the ministers of finance for the G7. This was the first in-person group of G7 ministers confirmed our support for the state of Israel, the people of Israel, and together we condemned the terrorist attacks led by Hamas. The honorable member for Belle Chambly. Unfortunately, the United States State Department didn't see things that way because it simply did not invite Canada. And it's deplorable because it prevents the government from doing its work well for its own communities, its own citizens. This morning, I talked about the relevance and the opportunity for everyone here to talk along similar lines in order to defend the interests of the Canadian Jewish community and peaceful Muslims. If they could convene leaders to privately discuss the issues. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
I very much appreciate the reality that all members of this House are facing members of the Liberal Party, members of the Conservative Party, members of the Bloc, and members of the NDP. We are all ready to show that for us, condemning Hamas's terrorist attacks and supporting Israel is not a partisan issue. It's a Canadian issue. That's the reality, and it's very important. Mr. Speaker, we are all shocked by the brutality, the kidnappings, and the targeting of civilians, including the elderly and children, by Hamas militants. And now, now the region is spiraling. Thousands of innocent Palestinians and Israelis have been killed in a conflict that they are not responsible for. Today we learned a fifth Canadian was murdered and we know more Canadians are amongst the captives. What is this government doing to ensure the hostages are protected and returned to safety? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I am glad to also hear the Honourable colleague from the NDP be clear in her condemnation of these terrorist attacks. It is very important to show that this is not a partisan issue for Canada. Clearly, I share and our government shares her concern for the hostages and we call for their immediate release. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. We are profoundly alarmed by what we are witnessing in Gaza. The UN has said that nearly half of Gaza's people have been forced to flee from their homes and that morgues are overflowing. This is a humanitarian crisis of extreme proportions. It took almost a week for the minister to start paying attention to the impact this war has had on Palestinians, even though thousands of people have been killed. Israelis and Palestinians have the right to live in peace. Why won't this government stand up for international law and call for a ceasefire? Here, here. Then I have this Premier Minister. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. <coughs> Our government is very clear that we support the State of Israel and we recognize Israel's right to defend itself within international law. As the Prime Minister has said, we are deeply concerned by the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza. International law must be respected and Canada will continue to support civilians of Gaza facing urgent humanitarian needs. That's why we announced an initial commitment of $10 million in humanitarian assistance to trusted partners. Great Thank job. you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. Years of failed Liberal NDP policies, this finance minister experiences inflation much different than everyday Canadians. Her enormous inflationary deficits led to 40 year highs in inflation that caused the bank of interest rates to go up more than ever in the history, and they're just not worth the cost. After promising to balance the budget, her own budgeting watchdog called her out, proving Liberal deficits could reach almost $50 billion this year. I guess budgets don't balance themselves after all. Can the finance minister tell Canadians how much she's adding to the federal debt this year? Or are we asking for too much? Mr. Speaker, our government will provide an update on the fiscal picture, both expenses and revenues in the fall economic update in due course. But let me be clear, Mr. Speaker, because I do not want Canadians to be misled by alarmist partisan talking points from the opposition. The reality, Mr. Speaker, is that Canada's position is fiscally responsible. We have the lowest debt and deficit in the G7, and our AAA rating has been reaffirmed by our ratings agencies. 
The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. The Finance Minister is known for speeding up just for the wrong reasons. By adding more debt than every government before them combined, she, she put the pedal to the metal on her deficits and revved up inflation. And unlike an Alberta highway, the consequences of her spending isn't just a speeding ticket. It's a bigger deficit, higher inflation that led to higher interest rates, putting Canada most at risk in the G7 for a mortgage default crisis. After eight years, they're definitely not worth the cost. Is the Finance Minister going to blow through her budget deficit projections again? buy more than $6 billion, yes or no? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, our government will provide an update on our fiscal position, on expenses and on revenues in the fall economic update in due course this fall. But I do want to be very, very clear on Canada's fiscal position. I was at the IMF World Bank Finance Minister's meeting just last week, and that is where it was so clear that Canada has the best, the lowest deficit, the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. Our position is enviable, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, it's nice to welcome back the Finance Minister. I was beginning to think that she forgot the address of this location. <laughs> After eight years, Canadians are worried, are realizing that this government's not worth the cost. Canadians are struggling, and this government continues to increase its deficits and in inflation. Everyone now agrees that deficits increase interest rates. So will the, will the Finance Minister finally confirm for Canadians that she'll balance the budget so that interest rates can come down and Canadians can keep their homes? I'd like to remind members that we are not to make an indirect or direct relationship to whether the presence of the members in this House or not, as is because, as you know, according to the rules, members have responsibilities that sometimes takes them out of this place. I'll have more to say on this later on this week. The Honourable uh, Vice uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you for that important comment, Mr. Speaker, but I am happy to confirm that I was not in the House of Commons last week. In fact, none of us were because... The Deputy Prime Minister has 20 seconds left on her clock. Last week was, of course, a constituency week. And I was proud to be able to do my job at the IMF World Bank Finance Minister's meeting, in particular because the G7 Finance Ministers affirmed our shared condemnation of Hamas and shared support for the State of Israel. The first time G7 ministers had met in person, Canada was at the table. That Again, I'd like... Again, I'd like to remind members that I'm quite well aware of the time that members have to ask and to answer questions. The Honourable Member from uh, Cinco North. Mr. Speaker, while households are dealing with higher interest rates, taxpayers are now on a bigger hook. That's because interest on the debt is going up. The government projected just a few months ago that it'll spend $44 billion on debt servicing costs this year, but that assumed wow. that interest rates would go down. Instead, interest rates have gone up. So will the Minister of Finance finally tell Canadians how much they're now on the hook for for higher debt servicing costs because interest rates haven't come down? That's right. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, our government will state Canada's fiscal position, revenues, costs, clearly in the fall economic statement in due course this fall. 
What the opposition clearly doesn't know or doesn't want to admit is that Canada's fiscal position is responsible, indeed is enviable, compared to our peer countries. This was reaffirmed by the independent ratings agency, DBRS Morningstar, which recently reaffirmed our AAA rating, and by S&P, which reaffirmed it after the budget. The Honourable Member for Chalabot, Otsai Charon. Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Budget Officer is expecting for the federal deficit to hit 40, or 46 billion next year. That's 16 percent higher than the original Liberal government projections. Interest rates are unlikely to go down before April of next year. During a housing crisis, that's a disaster. Can the Minister of Finance confirm that we're going to be paying six billion more in interest next year? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government will confirm budget numbers in the fall economic update. However, today I want to highlight a very important reality, a reality that should be reassuring for all Canadians. Canada's fiscal outlook is very strong. Our deficit and GDP ratio is the lowest of all G7 countries, and our AAA credit rating was reconfirmed by credit rating agencies. Le député de Charlebourg, Mr. Speaker, does the minister know that about 20 percent of mortgage loans are now at a negative rate, which means that they cannot pay more than interest? That's the inevitable result of increasing inflationary expenditures. No one listened, not the Bloc or the Liberals. After eight years of distresses management, will the Liberals rein in their expenses to help mortgage payments go down so that Canadians can keep their homes? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the question, but it's confusing to me that he would pose such a question when he has a plan that's actually going to increase the cost of building homes <laughs> and increase the cost of Canadians for living in them. His plan literally is to add taxes to home building in this country and to cut Shame. funding that's going to build more homes for Canadians. Shame. Mr. Speaker, over the course of our time in this House, over the last number of years, we have repeatedly put measures on the, play, uh, on the floor that are going to help improve the affordability of housing in this country. Time and time again, that member has voted against them. Thank you so much. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Mr. Speaker, if Canada is part, were part of the group formed by the United States to face the crisis between Israel and Gaza, Canada would be participating in decisions and have information firsthand. Is the government or can the Deputy Prime Minister tell us as of today if humanitarian pathways will be opened into Gaza and opened for civilians towards Egypt? The Honourable Minister of International Development. I just want to assure the Honourable Member that Canada was the first Western country to actually announce humanitarian assistance to civilians in Israel and Gaza. Not only that, by announcing it so early and so quickly, we've actually uh, incentivized other partners to move forward. We're working uh, with partners in the region and our trusted international organizations to ensure that we have access to civilians both in Gaza and Israel. We're working diligently and as mo events move forward, we'll continue to insist on international humanitarian access to civilians in Gaza. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois firmly condemns the terrorist attacks by Hamas. And reiterate, I reiterate that Israel has the right to defend itself. However, Hamas must be distinguished from all Gazans and the Palestinian people. Last Tuesday, the U UN called for a humanitarian corridor to Gaza for medical reasons. This is the basis of Article 3 of the Geneva Declaration of the Protection of Civilians, saying that the wounded and sick shall be collected and cared for. What is Canada doing in real terms to ensure that Israel does just that? The Honourable Minister for International Cooperation. Speaker, we are continuing with our long-standing position that in, in, uh, 
in conflict areas, humanitarian access must be provided to civilians to ensure that there is access to life-saving uh, food, medicine, and water. We, uh, I spoke yesterday with our trusted international partners as well as organizations on the ground, both international and Canadian. They have pre-positioned supplies. We are the first country that has moved forward to provide uh, much-needed humanitarian assistance, and we're insisting on that access so that we can deliver uh, to, to, to citizens and civilians who need uh, that uh, medical supplies. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Well, to send help, first we need a humanitarian corridor. We insist on it because Canada has been marginalized on the world stage. Once again, Canada sitting on the sidelines while the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, and Italy are all working together. That is not acceptable, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to human rights, Canada has a role to play and must insist on playing it. Has the minister spoken directly with Israel about opening a humanita humanitarian corridor into Gaza? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we're deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. A civilian is a civilian, and any loss of civilian life is deeply troubled. We continue to call for international law to be respected. The minister has been engaging directly with her counterparts in the region about the need for a humanitarian corridor to provide rapid and unimpeded access for relief, and she will continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kelowna, Lake Country. Speaker, after eight years, the NDP Liberal government's wasteful inflationary spending is keeping inflation high and causing interest rates to be the highest in a generation. Canadians are facing tough choices, including whether they have no option other than to sell the family home. A Credit Canada representative told Bloomberg, quote, selling the house might end up being the only option for some homeowners. Wow. Last week, I heard of a nurse living in her car in the Okanagan. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. When will the Prime Minister finally stop his inflationary spending so Canadians can keep a roof over their head? Mr. Speaker, I think it's fair to ask a question of the Conservatives when they talk about the inflationary spending. Are they talking about the programs that they're actually going to cut that are supporting people right now? Let's look at the measures that they're going to cut that they already voted against. Mr. Speaker, the question was about homelessness. When we put $1.3 billion on the table, they voted against it. Are they going to cut supports for the homeless? When we're talking about removing the GST so we can build more homes for middle class families in this country, they intend to vote against it. Are they going to cut that too? Mr. Speaker, when we put money on the table, for affordable housing. Time and time they vote against it. Are they going to cut that too? They are reckless. They are not worth the risk. We are here to support the middle class. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Government that declared victory on inflation only to see it skyrocket. That's right. James from Langley, BC told Global News that he and his husband are selling his home as a result of their mortgage payments and returning to the rental market. Mortgage defaults are climbing, with forced sales events up 10%, as just reported by the Toronto Real Estate Board. After eight years with this NDP Liberal government, people are being forced to sell their homes. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister Minister finally stop his inflationary spending so Canadians can keep a roof over their head. The Honourable Minister of Housing. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to share with my honourable colleague that I recently had a chance to sit down with the mayor of the township of Langley to discuss their application of the Housing Accelerator Fund, which this member and her party is promising to get rid of. Yeah. We want to be there for the cities to help the very kind of people that she's asking about her in her question that she promises to cut the support out from under should they form government. Mr. Speaker, if the honourable member is serious about building houses in this country, I would invite her to support Bill C-56, which is going to remove the tax on the construction of new homes and I can't understand why they oppose it. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of Liberal government, we've seen compulsive deficits and unchecked inflationary spending. As a result, they've had a significant impact on increasing interest rates. According to Quebec's National Institute for Scientific Research, one in five Quebecers has difficulty repaying their debt, and 
is likely to give up the keys to their home after eight years of Liberal government. Will this government finally understand that their that managing things irresponsible, managing things irresponsibly is expensive for Quebecers and all Canadians. Then I have the, the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, we've just heard partisan arguments, but let me give you some facts. Canada's position is responsible. We have a AAA credit rating, and that was reconfirmed by credit agencies. We have the lowest debt-to-GDP ratio in the G7. But if the Conservatives want to help us with the housing crisis, they need to support our legislation, C-56. That's the reality. De Vancouver, Kingsway. Millions of Canadians are going without their prescription medications because they can't afford, afford. them. Thousands die mm -hmm. as a result. Universal public pharmacare will cover everyone and save us billions of dollars. Yep. This weekend, NDP members sent a clear message to deliver it. Now, the Liberals themselves promised public pharmacare 26 years ago, wow. and their own convention delegates voted for it in 2016, 2018, and 2020. Will the Liberals keep their word and finally deliver the public pharmacare that Canadians need and want? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I have enormous uh, regard for my colleague. I know his commitment and passion um, to help reduce costs for Canadians is there. He would know, therefore, that the work that we've taken jointly with provinces and territories on bulk purchasing to see $3.5 billion in saving by working together to reduce costs for Canadians has happened. He knows that we've taken critical action on diseases, uh, rare diseases and drugs for rare diseases. He knows that we've taken critical action on patented drugs. And yes, we are having a discussion on Pharmacare legislation. I look forward to a continued productive conversation as we look at all of the health cares and priorities in keeping Canadians safe and healthy. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, it won't just save lives. Universal public drug coverage will save patients, workers, hospitals, and employers billions of dollars. It's time the Liberals took action. It's not just NDP activists who are saying it. All the studies and reports say the same thing. Even Liberal Party delegates voted for universal public pharmacare three conventions in a row. When will this government stop dragging its feet and deliver true universal pharmacare? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And... One thing is clear, we need to bring down costs for drugs all across the country, and that's the action our government is taking. We are bringing down costs for almost three, by almost $3.5 billion by buying medications together with the provinces and territories, by pooling our purchasing, and by working with our partners to find uh, a way forward. And certainly we are working with all members here in the House to bring down the cost of medications. Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While the Leader of the Opposition continues to blame municipal mayors and councillors for our housing challenges, we've decided to work in collaboration with other levels of government, including our municipal partners. Our housing programs, including the Housing Accelerator Fund, incentivizes municipalities, nonprofits, and private sector to build more affordable homes, including purpose built rentals. Can the Minister of Housing and Infrastructure please share with the House the importance of working in partnership with other levels Excellent of government question. and other housing stakeholders? Wow. <laughs> 
Mr. Speaker, let me take this opportunity to thank my honourable colleague for his advocacy as the chair of our Housing Caucus for policies that will help change the way that cities in this country build home. What's more, Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague made an announcement last week on behalf of the federal government that we will be announcing more than $93 million in his city that's going to lead over the next three years to the construction of more than 2,600 homes and nearly 9,000 over the next decade. Mr. Speaker, we are going to require that cities build homes closer to transit, closer to post-secondary institutions, and I look forward to continuing my cooperation with that member so we see more homes built in the City of Hamilton. Now, I'm deputy to Peterborough, Kawartha. Canadians, Conservatives, we all know after eight years of this Prime Minister, he's just not worth the cost. But the Liberals and NDP still aren't receiving this message. Don't believe me? Take a look at the headlines. Average rent went up another 11 per cent in past year, and even getting a roommate doesn't help much. Canada's rental crisis is getting worse, according to a new report that found that the average asking price for rent in September was $2,149, up wow. by more than 11 per cent more than a year ago. Enough. When will he stop his inflationary spending so Canadians can actually afford housing? Good question. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for her question, and I would point out that over the course of the past week, she attended the opening of a new affordable housing project that we funded in her own community, taking credit for a program that she, in fact, voted against. Mr. Speaker, the reality is, when it comes to housing, we have a plan to change the math so it works for builders. We have a plan to change the way that cities build homes. We have a plan to continue to invest in affordable housing and to grow the productive capacity of the workforce. Mr. Speaker, the opposition's plan is to raise taxes on home building and to cut funding that's going to build those homes. We're going to continue to build more houses to make sure that everyone in this country can afford a roof over their head. After eight years of this Prime Minister, Canadians can't afford a house, and that's the reality. And we will continue to vote against inflationary spending that is driving up household debt. Canadians are paying more on their on the interest of their debt. They cannot afford a home. This is from Vicky. My single 30-plus daughter and two grandkids just moved in because she could no longer afford her $2,500-plus rent. She had to give up her job to move back into town with me. So I'm basically supporting all three. So yeah, when will they learn how to manage money, decide about monetary policy, and actually build homes, not bureaucracy? Mr. Speaker, I, I assure you I am not making this up. She's talking about a lack of affordable housing in her community. We are literally discussing an affordable housing project funded by our government in Peterborough, and she voted against that particular policy. Mr. Speaker, she says she's going to continue to vote against these kinds of policies that are literally putting a roof over the head of some of her constituents, most vulnerable constituents in her community. Mr. Speaker, the honourable member has an opportunity to get more homes built in her community. She can support Bill C-56, remove the tax on new home construction, and invite some of her colleagues to do it with Now I have Deputy to Charles, Charles Wood, St. James, Sniboa. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, a half a billion dollars in inflationary deficits have fueled 40-year inflation highs, wow. causing the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates. In the midst of a housing crisis, mortgage defaults and forced home sales are on the rise. People are losing their homes. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister finally put an end to his inflationary spending so that Canadians can keep a roof over their head? Mr. Speaker, let me share some facts. Canada has the lowest debt to GDP ratio and the lowest deficit in the G7. That is a fact. 
Canada has a AAA rating. That is also a fact. And you know what else is a fact, Mr. Speaker? The opposition, which claims to care about the housing challenges Canadians face, is blocking Bill C-56, which experts across the country say is essential to get more rental homes built. That is sheer, utter hypocrisy, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for montmagny lille kamouraska rivière du loup Mr. Speaker, this government's policies have forced the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates 10 times, and the impact is devastating. The latest example, 20 percent of mortgages with the big banks are now in negative amortization. This means the monthly payment doesn't cover the interest, so the amount owing keeps going up. It's a loan that never ends. When will the Liberals put an end to their inflationary deficits so that rates can come down and Canadians can stay in their homes? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. I'm looking forward to the day where the Conservative Party opposite will finally vote in favour of things that will do precisely what people need to help keep the roofs over their heads. And I hope, Mr. Speaker, that they will vote in favour of the what the construction professionals and the municipality, the Federation of Municipal Municipalities have said they're delighted that we've cut the GST on the construction of new homes. The Honourable Member for rivière des Mille-Îles. Mr. Speaker, based on an online consultation, the federal government has tossed out the Quebec winners of a competition to design a monument to the mission in Afghanistan. Well, the experts at Léger have studied that consultation, and they say the approach was not scientific. According to Léger, the results cannot be interpreted as the opinion of members of the armed forces. Any use of these data generalized to the public is faulty. Mr. Speaker, the basis for eliminating the Quebec bid was faulty. Will they give the contract to the Dow team? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for his question. Mr. Speaker, I think we all agree on the importance of our veterans, and that's why the department conducted a poll. Over 10,000 Canadians answered the poll, and most of them were veterans. And the concept that was selected was by Stimson, and people felt that that better reflected the sacrifice and the bravery of our veterans. Mr. Speaker, we will always support our veterans, and that's why we chose the winning concept. The Honourable Member for Rivière des Mille-Îles. Mr. Speaker, this is from Léger, the leading experts on polls. They say the federal government's poll is not scientific and that the results are not reliable. Even Louise Arbour, former Supreme Court justice, had to come out on Thursday to ask the federal government to play by their own rules. It's come to this, Mr. Speaker. There's a limit how far you can go to shut Quebec out. Will the government follow its own rules, listen, listen to Justice Arbour, and award the contract to the Dow team? The Honourable Minister of Veterans. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, and I look forward to working with him on the Veterans Affairs Committee. All members here recognize the importance of our veterans, and that's why we conducted the poll. And the vast majority of respondents inc were included veterans and their family members. And they felt that the design we chose best reflected the sacrifice and the bravery of our veterans. Mr. Speaker, I have a question for my honor honorable colleague. Does he want us to ignore the expressed wishes of our veterans? The Honourable Member for Foothills. There's inflationary spending and carbon taxes. Food prices have skyrocketed, and many Canadians had empty tables at Thanksgiving. 
This is because of broken Liberal promises and a Liberal-made financial crisis. Canadian grocery CEOs did not commit to meet the Liberals' lower food prices by Thanksgiving. Now, as a result, many Canadians can't afford to feed their families, a quarter are skipping meals, and millions of Canadians had to rely on food banks for their Thanksgiving dinner. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister end his inflationary spending so Canadians can afford to feed their families? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, while the Conservative leader was having a self-aggrandizing, goodwill hunting delusion in an apple orchard, <laughs> our government was focused on stabilizing food prices for middle-class Canadians. By calling on the five grocery chain CEOs uh, to produce action plans that would make a difference for, for Canadians. Our government is now uh, tracking and monitoring and holding the grocery chains accountable. Uh, while the Conservatives talk turkey, we'll talk results for Canadians. Hey. Colleagues. Colleagues, I saw that the uh, member from Foothills had difficulty hearing the answer to the question that he had asked. I ask that we try to keep it down. And to all members, I ask that they please use comments which will not cause disturbance in the House. The Honourable Member from Foothills. Broken Liberal promises and, broken, and li Liberals making light of the food crisis does not put food on the table. Many Canadians are starving because of the Liberals' broken promise to lower food prices by Thanksgiving. That is not what happened. Food prices are up 7 per cent over last year. Now, the Prime Minister promised to lower food prices by Thanksgiving dinner. He failed. Another broken promise. So will the Prime Minister promise to lower his out-of-control spending so Canadians can afford a Christmas dinner, or will that be another promise broken? We were doing so well on a day that was on a very sensitive issue internationally. I ask you to please continue with your good behaviour for the day, and I ask in particular the member Grand from Grand Prairie, uh, please, uh, to uh, keep the comments to the time that he is asking questions. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And on this side of the House, we continue to do the hard work to ensure that Canadian families are supported. Just look to our investment to create a nationwide system of early learning and childcare, or look to our Canada Child Benefit. On this side of the House, we are making investments to make sure that families can buy the food, can get the school supplies and the sneakers that their kids need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable... The Honourable Member from, um, from Dufferin Caledon. Well, Mr. Speaker, they must have a very def different definition of hard work than Conservatives have, because after eight years of this Liberal government, we know that food prices are out of control. That's right. I went to the grocery store in Orangeville this past weekend for Thanksgiving. A loaf of Wonder Bread was $4.40. That's the definition of Liberal hard work. And how do we get there, Mr. Speaker? Massive inflationary deficits, a carbon tax that's driving up the cost of everything. Right. The fake photo ops of the Prime Minister isn't going to fix anything. Well, they cut the carbon tax, balance the budget, so Canadians can pay for food. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government is fighting for Canadians on affordability every step of the way. We're fully seized with addressing the affordability challenges that Canadians are facing by calling in the top five grocery CEOs to work with us to stabilize food prices. 
Conservatives can call this a photo op. I think calling decisive action for Canadians on affordability a photo op says more about them than it does about us, Mr. Speaker. Regardless of the Conservatives' attacks, we'll stay focused on the pressing needs of Canadians. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Pontiac. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Small businesses and medium-sized businesses are at the heart of Quebec's economy, and that's why it's so important for the government to support them at crucial points in their economic development. I'd like to hear what the Minister of Tourism and Economic Development for the Regions of Quebec I'd like her to tell us what the Liberal government is doing to support uh, small and medium-sized businesses and especially Indigenous entrepreneurs. The Honourable Minister of Economic Development for the Regions of Quebec. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is right. Our government has been supporting women-led and particularly Indigenous-led businesses. We announced uh, funding of $100,000 for a company in Gatineau. It was founded by two brilliant women, Krisha and Melanie, and they celebrate the diversity and the richness of Indigenous uh, cultures. We celebrate their success, and we're there to support them. Happy Small Business Week. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Millwoods. Prime Minister's gatekeeping, anti-pipeline, anti-resource development policies, hundreds of billions of dollars of project investments have fled Canada and taken countless po powerful paychecks away from Canadian workers. These Liberals just aren't worth the cost. Conservatives warned the Liberals that their plans to steamroll provinces by giving themselves unprecedented powers over provincial infrastructure, industry, natural resources through their No More Pipelines Bill, Bill C-69, was unconstitutional. Will they re repeal Bill C-69 now that the Supreme Court has ruled it unconstitutional, yes or no? I, I would like to correct my, my colleague uh, and uh, the fact that the Supreme Court last week issued an opinion. It was not a decision. But let me, let me give you some elements from... If, if the members want a briefing by the Justice Department on the difference, we would be happy to provide that to them, Mr. Speaker. Let me, let me quote from the Supreme Court on, uh, on what they said. This appeal is not whether Parliament can enact legislation to protect the environment. It is clear that Parliament can do so under the heads of power assigned to it under the Constitution Act of 1867. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Exactly. Then I have Deputy uh, Brantford 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 Brant. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this government's ongoing corruption, we have yet another scandal. Conflicts of interest, nepotism, yeah. abuse of power, and now we have allegations of criminality around the contracting practices in the top offices of this government. The $54 million price tag for the Arrive scam app is just the tip of the iceberg. Last week, the NDP Liberal Coalition voted to shut down the testimony of the Auditor General's review of this scandal. Why? But I have missed. Mr. Speaker, my honourable colleague knows very well that committees make their own decisions in terms of the work they want to do. What we have said, Mr. Speaker, is that at all times we expect people to comply with the contracting policies of the Government of Canada and those that decide to do something that is worthy of a criminal investigation will obviously be investigated by the appropriate authorities. Absolutely. And we don't comment on investigations that the RCMP might decide to do on any of these issues. The Honourable Member for Megantic-Lérable. 
Mr. Speaker, after eight years of liberal management, it's scandal upon scandal. We've just learned the RCMP has opened a criminal investigation into ArriveCan, which cost Canadians $54 million for nothing. It was a Montreal firm, Bottler, who sounded the alarm. For one contract, a senior liberal government official strongly recommended that Bottler work with the same ArriveCan firm, GC Strategies, a two-person firm with no office and no computer expertise. Bottler identified what looks an awful lot like an organized system of collusion. After eight years of turning a blind eye, will the Liberals tell us who's getting richer at our expense when it comes to awarding contracts? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've said repeatedly, we expect all those who work for the Government of Canada to follow the contracting rules, Treasury Board rules and other rules that apply. In the case of these allegations, Mr. Speaker, there could be some criminal activity, and we expect the appropriate authorities to investigate, and that's precisely what this government will allow them to do. Speaker, in communities across Canada and in my riding of Scarborough Centre, many Canadians are finding it difficult to find an affordable place to call home. Rather than scapegoating newcomers, we must work to ensure that they be a part of the solution to the housing crisis. Can the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship inform the House of our government's plan to tackle the labour shortage in the construction sector and build more homes for Canadians. Okay. Mr. Speaker, immigration is key to our economic growth, and now more than ever, we need skilled trades in this country. Uh, that's why this summer we launched a global express entry system into this country to make sure the skilled labour workers could get in here in a faster pace. Simply put, more workers at a faster pace to get all those homes built. We need those workers. We need them from abroad. We need them here. They'll get the homes built. Here, here. Député de Timmins Bay James. The planet is on fire, and we just had Suncor CEO Rich Kruger tell us how he's going to maximize profits for big oil while the rest of us suffer a climate catastrophe. In a year of record profits, they fired 1,500 workers. In a year of unprecedented climate fire, mm. their climate Shame. solution is to massively increase fossil fuel burning. Big oil is laughing at this government. I hate to interrupt the member. I hate to interrupt members. This guy has to sit at the bottom when our leader asks questions. I hate to interrupt the member, but I'm having trouble hearing the member. Can the member please continue? It's 20 seconds left on the clock. Thank you, sir. True certainly hurts the Conservative Party. As the planet burns, and they're supporting the massive increase in fossil fuel burning, which is why they backed Rich Kruger from CEO. The question is, what concrete steps will this government take to hold big oil to account to protect Alberta jobs, Canadian communities, and our planet? from the, com the fires that are happening from the climate crisis. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Changement Climatique and the Environment. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I thank the Honourable Colleague for his question. In fact, our government uh, have taken and are taking a number of measures to ensure that big oil companies do their fair share when it comes to fighting climate change. We're the first G7 countries to have eliminated fossil fuel subsidies two years ahead of schedule, something that the Conservative Party of Canada would never do. They want to make pollution free, Mr. Speaker. We've also implemented measures to reduce methane emission by at least 40 percent by 2025 and 75 percent by 2030, which will make it one of the most ambitious measures in the world to reduce methane emission from the oil and gas sector. We have many more things coming, including a cap on the emissions of the oil and gas sector, Mr. Speaker. Thank Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, after the Governor General's lavish spending on international travel, we've learned her office spent over $117,000 on dry cleaning since 2018, an average of $1,800 per month. For fun, I did some calculations based on the going rate for these services. At the rates she's been spending, 
that's an average of three outfits a day, 365 days a year. Why doesn't the government cut her $33 million budget? What are they waiting for? Because she's clearly incapable of managing taxpayers' money seriously and responsibly. The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, the Governor General has done important work for Canada. Obviously, we expect every dollar she spends to be done uh, in a rigorous and conscientious way. Thank you. Well, this brings to the end of question period. I understand there's going to be a number of uh, points of order. Uh, I'd first like to recognize.